Yeah. Okay. All right. So it looks like we're ready to get started. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, so uh, I'm Abhinav, me, Tsingyeng, and Nan, and Adam will be presenting NLP uh, for uh, the advanced attention. So the uh, first, first we will uh, recap of, uh, we'll do a recap of sequence to sequence um, <coughs> for machine translation. Uh, so in the previous class, we saw how sequence to sequence recurrent neural networks can help in machine translation. And we had something like this. Uh, this is a sequence to sequence recurrent neural network. So we have an encoder here which uh, takes a sentence in, in French and then um, we pass it to the RNA and then we get an encoded sentence and then we decode to get an encoded sentence back. So it consists of an encoder RNA and an encoder RNA and then, um, then you start generating the French sentence. So today we'll be doing a recap of this, but uh, we'll do a full walkthrough for the English to French translation instead of going to the slides. Um, so uh, I've written this code, but uh, I want to tell you a few things. This code is not production ready, so I just do, a, do the training and then uh, store the model. There is no validation in the French translation, but we can add it later if you want to use it in your projects. Um, so and, and also there is already a tutorial which is there. Um, online, you uh, can refer to it. It, it also does sequence to sequence uh, machine translation from English to French. Uh, I've used PyTorch to uh, do this tutorial, and then um, the tutorial which is there online doesn't have batching. Uh, so, what batching does is it takes a batch of examples and then forward propagates it through the video network. Uh, in the tutorial which is there online, it takes a single example and keeps doing it. Uh, ideally, this is not how you want to do it because it will take a lot of time. If you do it batch wise, then you can forward pop it and back pop it uh, to the return to the input and, and save time. So, so yes, uh, so we have we have the English and the French sentences stored in the text file. What we do is initially we process the text. First, you need to totalize the English and the French sentence. For example, if you have a sentence that I like French, and then you split it into, you split it into words. To do this, you can, you can use simple spaces to split it, or you can use more sophisticated tokenizer storage, such as most tokenizer which is available in many people to do this. And then, uh, and then you add the start of the sentence and make the sentence to any sentence. This indicates that you are tagging the sentence and ending the sentence, where the user network can, can learn uh, pattern creation, for example. If you get a start of sentence, then, then there is a possibility that you start uh, generating the sentence properly. So you, um, you do this. And 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 then uh, and then you start assigning total numbers to each of these words, uh, where every word will have a total number assigned. And for example, so uh, so uh, so this total number range from zero to number of words in the vocab. So vocab is the total number of words that you have in a particular language. Maybe your English and English, the corpus that you consider for English might have like twenty thousand words, and for the corpus that you consider for French might have ten thousand words. So I like French, but my French converted to so internally wise, this will be used to uh, initialize like the embedding matrix. Say you have uh, an embedding, you have 20,000 English words, then your, and your embedding dimension is like 100, then the embedding matrix will have something like 20,000 or 200, 100 dimensional uh, matrix. So, and then there are other tasks that you can do, like now keep only alpha numeric characters, remove stoppers, and so on. So this is the initial pre-processing of text. Now let's look how to code an, code an encoder, RNA encoder. So this is the high-level diagram for the RNA encoder. You have a sentence language and a French and then you pass it through, you pass it through the embedding language to get an embedding and then uh, you have the outputs. So um, so, uh, so we'll see what is sent for the embedding of the sentence in MRI once we go to the code. So uh, this is how PyTorch uh, works. So you have, you, you just need to define. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. So so you need to define something for us uh, a module, and then you need to uh, tell PyTorch how you forward propagate it. Uh, it will construct a graph also, PyTorch, and then automatically it will do the backwards for you. So this is an encoder class. So you always need to define a power function which means the power class. And then x here is the input that you get. 
here it's a bad technique where you have ten sentences of each open speech. And then you pass it through the embedding layer, which is do it by embedding effect. Here you can see if you pass something like each open, then every uh, every word will get embedded into a new direction. Um, and then you pass and then you define a sensor encoder. Sensor encoder is nothing but a GI, you are just a GI here. You pass the feed uh, the uh, the input and you get the previous uh, it is get an input and then it will calculate the output and HN. So so the our dedicated board is um, what is HN and what is output here? Output are outputs are uh, the mean state for the I and second. And then you have HN which is the mean state for the last time. So those are the two things. And so this is the encoder and then you can you can see uh, you can define a similar thing for the decoder where the decoder takes the uh, start of the sentence and starts generating uh, the sentence. For example, I like them, which gets translated into it and it. So 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 this 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 is what the decoder does. The code for the decoder also looks very similar. Um, you have the decoder again it's just very similar. You have to give it you give it uh, the input and then you give it the initial real state which is the real state for the previous for the for the RNA cell. And then you get the same thing, which is the output and the um uh that you can say for the last time step that you have in the RNA. So and then you return that. So that decoder also looks very similar. So so now you can see how to combine the encoder and the decoder. That's what the sequence is different. Uh, the recurrent user network here. So for that, so this is one advantage of using Python. Everything is composable. You can define the encoder, define the decoder, and then combine it together. So it will change for So uh, so this is this is the very sequence to sequence network plan that I have defined. And here also you can see that you have a forward function. Everything has a forward function. You need to define the forward flow. So you get you use the encoder that you define earlier and the decoder that you define earlier. Uh, but for the decoder now, what you do is you can see the encoder and check the variable, which is the last last encoded vector that you get from the encoder, and then you pass it through the decoder as the initial state. So this is the uh, this is the connection between the encoder and the decoder. Abhinav, can you turn on your microphone? Is your microphone on? Uh, I think it's on. We don't seem to hear any noise. I your. Can anyone else verify that whether they can hear the video stream? Now, now can you hear? Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, great. Okay, so you define a forward function during the training, and but, uh, the default function, what it does is during the reference time, like now you have um, in the sentence, now you want to generate the French sentence, that's what the default function will do. Um, so it's again the same thing, except that you need to know that okay, for the, you need to generate it over uh, uh, times like uh, over the time steps. For this, you need to um, the word that you generate at one point in time will be given as an input to do the next at the next time step. So the microphone seems to have went off again. Time. Can you check your sound? Mine. Yeah. Yeah, two people on webcast can't hear. Can you guys still hear? No, something is not picking up. I also cannot hear your voice anymore. Sorry, everyone. Okay, well, uh, let me try turning on my microphone and then maybe uh, they can listen to there. Can you guys hear now? Okay, well, we'll just try it. Um, yeah, because I can hear, I can see my microphone is picking up. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so this is how you combine the decoder and the decoder. So, you have uh, the uh, you pass it through the, you take the decoder input, which is like a start token, and then you uh, get a vector 
I mean, you get the you get the predictions, and then you take the maximum prediction and make it the decoder input for the next step. So this is what it does. So and then you do a bunch of um, you get the training data set. This is all the setup that you do. Um, uh, PyTorch also has uh, something like you can load all the all the sentences per batch. Maybe you can you can give the batch size here, say okay, 32. So it will load 32 sentences at a time for you, and then <coughs> set up some hyperparameters like number of epochs and then batch size. You give you get the English vocab size, French vocab size, and so on. The embedding dimension is I've used the same embedding dimension both for the encoder and the decoder, and then you can just Play around with this. So after this, then you get the model up and running, and then define the criterion. The criterion is nothing but the loss function that you would want to use along with your uh, sequence to sequence table approach. Um, and and then you st and then yeah. So you basically train the network over a certain number of epochs. So you just go on, I've trained it for like 25 epochs and then you can see that the loss reduces. And then I have, this is an example of the source and the target sentence. It said, I don't know, I don't do that as often as I would like to, then it gets translated to it and okay, but that goes on. But this is not perfect. Um, there is actually, it, it, it actually has to be this. So it stopped here, it didn't, it didn't predict. Like I said, the code is not perfect. You can play around with it. So, and then, um, yeah, so, um, so, yes, uh, this is it. Uh, for the generation, I didn't show it in the notebook. I have a file code as simple segen.py. If you want to use use the code, just let me know. I'll just pass it. Or I'll post it in the slide. So, this is just a uh, um, normal sequence to sequence. Uh, neural network, but uh, the attention based. Let's see how to run the attention based neural network. So yes, um, so um, here more, most of the things more or less remains the same. Only the decoder changes. Again, PyTorch helps you. If you define a new decoder, then you can use the previous encoder and the new decoder combining together to make it an attention based neural network. So. Um, and then you have, yeah, so why did the attention decoder come into place? Like we saw in the previous classes, the sequence to sequence neural networks encodes all the uh, information into a single vector. But here, uh, this creates a bottleneck. Uh, so uh, attention was a mechanism which was used to alleviate this problem. So um, this is from the previous uh, class slide. So you have the encoder hidden states, and this is the decoder hidden state. All they do is they, um, uh, uh, dot product with all the hidden states of the encoder uh, and then pass it to a soft match to get the attention distribution. Then the attention distribution is like a vector um, which, is, which sums up to one. So these are kind of the weights. These weights will be linearly combined with the hidden states of the encoders and then you get the attention output. You combine the attention output with the decoder hidden state that you have here. So that's what they say, compare to get attention output with the decoder hidden state. Then use to compute then use that to make the um, prediction. So, so um, intuitively, what it means is while decoding, then you are con you are letting the decoder concentrate on some of the words, some of the words in encoder. But this this is known as alignment, as we saw in the previous class. This kind of solves the alignment problem, and and here the alignment is learned. And yeah, so the only thing which changes is the decoder actually. So nothing else changes. So, so you can see it's easy to code. So, so um, let me not go. I've written all the dimensions here, so it becomes apparent what we're doing. Um, so, get the next state from the previous state. This is this is the same as passing passing the um, passing through the decoder a previous decoder input, uh, the decoder input and the previous hidden state that we have, and then multiply the hidden vector with the encoder output. So, here what you're doing. Uh, don't worry about all the functions. Once you go through it, then, then it becomes easier. What you're doing is this. Um, uh, this exactly is done in one step in PyTorch. All this is done in one step. So what you get is um, what you get is for 
for <coughs> so yes so what you get is for um, all the time steps you get a um, you get a you get the attention distribution like this you get something like this and then you pass it through the softmax yeah you pass it through the softmax and then that this is the context vectors or the attention vectors here what you do is do the linear combination so so you linearly combine to get the attention output right so this is what you do here so there are functions for this like torch dot multiplication which takes two um, matrices and does element wise multiplication and then um, and then that's it this this um, concatenated this concatenating is combining it with the hidden vector from this step so so this is the step that does this and then uh, just to make sure that the interface remains the same for uh, the encoder for the RNNs that we have so you just concatenate it and then return it this is the attention decoder so here you can see you do it step by step uh, but uh, if you see PyTorch then, then actually it has an internal point of where it passes all your tokens into the point of and then processes it so I have just done this manually because attention you need for every step, you need to uh, calculate the attention over the encoder. So, so you need to do this manually go through the for loop. So it takes a little bit of time. This is not as optimized. If you use PyTorch's um, encoder that you have, then then it is more optimized. They convert it into CVM. So yes, that's it. Everything else remains the same. Here you can see again, it reaches a better loss setting. Uh, but again, reaching a better loss doesn't mean that the translation will work. There are many missing parts of the tutorial that you can do if you're, if you're doing a translation for it. So, yeah, so let's see an example of translation. So, yeah, oh. Anyways, so, uh, yeah, again, I have the file for generating this function, uh, generating the translation. Uh, yes, you can also do something like visualizing the attention, which the other. Um, which the other um, tutorial does. Like for example, while generating, just uh, um, visualize where the attentions are going, then it gives you an idea of whether your decoder is concentrating on the proper words. So you can do this, uh, which I have done. And that's just a short code book. I'll just pass it to the CNN. So that was pretty amazing. I mean, one million of us wouldn't dare to do a code demo during a lecture. Uh, I know it's pretty difficult to do that. So uh, hats off to Anibal. I think there was a question here. Um, so I, 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 I was thinking about one of the issues about the attention Mm -hmm. In which types of applications for in, NLP? In fuzzing. In fuzzing? In fuzzing? Yeah, in, in like, uh, Okay. Do you guys have any comments about that? Um, where an adversary might take uh, to place attention outside of the current bounds that would make it more difficult? I mean, that's definitely an adversarial problem, I think. Okay. Essentially, the way you uh, go against this is you start also holding the token to the maximum entropy, which are most likely to be uh, the ones that will be outside the bounds of the whatever you're going to attack. So you're reserving part of your probability mass in some ways, so looking, reserving part of your attention for things outside of what you see, right? Yeah. So, in some yeah. sense, some type of zero shot concept that you're reserving yeah. uh, bandwidth for things yeah. not seen. So I mean, I, when I first came upon this problem, I couldn't solve it, but I was looking at it again, but it's obviously an inattention and an inattention mm -hmm. and, and how do you spread the inattention around for the um, things outside you, you of what you're seeing? You start looking at minimum activation between tokens, like, you know, like, the tokens and the tokens. I 
Okay, so something like an active a style uh, to, to determine which which parts uh, sure. need more sure. more modeling capability. Yeah. Any of you have any um, points that you'd like to bring up? You guys are awfully quiet today. Maybe it's because it's midterms season <laughs> in NUS. Okay, yeah, we'll go ahead uh, okay. with okay. our listening uh, to continue yeah. on. Okay, so uh, thanks for Adine's solid work. So I will continue, actually I will continue on her attention. So uh, last time we talked about uh, Anna and Adine already helped us to review the uh, uh, attention uh, in the sequence to sequence. And so I'm here, I just want to point out so the procedure to uh, imam us and it's maybe the procedure, uh, additional procedure. So first is to calculate the scores. If they say each encoding is fit, and then we just use the softmax to compute the probability distribution, and uh, at last we get the weighted sum. Uh, okay, uh, actually the attention can, uh, uh, not only uh, that's limited, actually it's a quite a general concept. So it can be used uh, more broadly, so instead of just limited to the machine translation, uh, uh, to make it make the concept um, broader, so I give maybe we can give it another definition. So uh, actually, so we can use um, in, uh, so the improvement of the attention is that instead of using the last step, uh, hidden state of the encoding stage, we use all of them. So it's kind of like have some memory. So this uh, kind of memory, I can. So for me, I just see it's like a database, uh, and uh, w what you have uh, in your uh, so you use your decoding state, a hidden state value to uh, get that weighted sum. So this process can be seen as a query inside the database. So give it some query to select from uh, where black, so something black, what what what, and then you give it an uh, aggregation. So. Mm, uh, here, uh, I just say that uh, we have a set of vectors, which is uh, uh, an encoding hidden space. And then we have one vector, so which is a current uh, decoding hidden space. And uh, we, we see that the attention actually is a query. It's a query in that set, those values. Uh, we, can, we can say that sometimes we can say, so uh, the query attends to these values. And for example, we can see uh, in this case it is the decoder hidden state attend to the encoder hidden state. So uh, you just can see it like, like a pure So actually, this committed a uh, very broad uh, application. So uh, the, uh, how do we calculate? So uh, first, we need to have some score, right? So how do we calculate the score? Uh, actually, there are many ways. So basically, there are three variants. So the first one is the easiest one, which is just a soft problem. So it's the thing that we learned. Uh, we use, actually it's used in your program. Yeah. Yeah. So actually there are other other things. So um, uh, it can be, uh, you can put a metric in, in the middle. So what what is that actually? So it's just, um, you, you have the, uh, you have the inner product. Actually you give e each term a uh, weight. So actually, in this case, you can kill two more things. Uh, and the last one is a additive, additive form. Uh, so all these three are how can you or what you can choose to uh, compute the scores. Okay, the last one is too complicated. So, uh, actually, the attention can be applied to many areas. So uh, I just read one example. So this one is uh, you get a sequence of words. Uh, then you want to predict the next word. So how, how do you do that? So for this sentence is fat chair, Jenny Yellen, wrist, wrist, and then da, 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 it, it's Mrs. Who. So actually, uh, for us, we can see that most probably the skills are Yellen. So the, the, the text that appeared uh, previously. Uh, what is this name, this Yellen? It is, uh, so when you train this model, you didn't pull it into the, uh, the train data set. What if it, it is not inside there? So 
uh, in the embeddings, it can uh, get, so if you use co occurrence matrix, it will get very low uh, probability. And then, so when you calculate, at, at last you calculate the top max, maybe this, this balance, it has very low probability, although it already happened, appeared in the previous context. So what should we do? So, so in this case, uh, maybe we don't, uh, we not just look not just looking at the, uh, the vocabulary, we also look at what are the words that already appear in the previous. So we call it a pointer. So it's a pointer pointing to the previous words. So in this case, so uh, we just consider all the words that already appear. So you, you just look at this green, this uh, green box. So uh, at, at this case, you calculate the uh, score of each of the uh, previous uh, previous appeared work, and then you give it a top max, and then uh, the yellow is the most probable one, and we will use that. So this, this is a very simple idea. So and uh, um, uh, previously people already raised it, and uh, in, in this one, uh, in this um, uh, actually it's uh, I read from a paper, and in this paper it's give it uh, 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 it make it make a uh, make a uh, mix mixture model. So what is a mixture model? So because uh, so. Uh, if you use the pointer, actually you only consider the word that appeared previously. So what if the, the word not appeared previously, it appeared in the vocabulary? Actually you cannot uh, predict the next word is some, some word that's in the vocabulary and not uh, appeared previously. So in this case, uh, we should better use the, still use the original soft map method and pick a word from the vocabulary, right? So actually the cases can change it. So some, in some case, uh, or we with the better pick a word from the vocabulary, and in some words, uh, in, in some cases that we should pick a word from the previous uh, pure word. So, for example, this uh, very rare word yellow. So, uh, how do we switch between these two cases? So, we use a mixture model, and we have some very magic number of uh, probability here, which is g. So, this is so in some probability. Uh, uh, so, in some case, there is a very high probability that the next word should happen in the vocabulary. And in, in, uh, and, uh, in some cases, that there is a very high probability that the word should appear in the previous, previous word. And uh, actually, we train our model to get this G also. And then we just combine them. And uh, uh, so you just use uh, this joint probability. And you can, uh, uh, you, you can uh, predict what's the probability of the yellow. So uh, this is a um, uh, flow graph of this this model, and you can see that, uh, so in the, also the blue part, the, the bottom part, sorry. The bottom part is the original RNN model. So it's actually, it just take all the previous hidden states, and then at the last one, you get one hidden state, and you use the softmax to get the uh, 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 probability distribution. And then here you, you so what, what, uh, and what, what I have just mentioned that is uh, essentially a kind of a query. So from this state, also this state, we can give it a query to the uh, uh, to, to to this upper level, and uh, this query will uh, is uh, very similar to the uh, sequence to sequence attention. So it will multiply with each uh, uh, hidden state that we calculated previously. And then you accumulate them into one array and use the softmax, and then uh, you pick pick the word from the previous previously shared word. So it's very similar. Uh, but how do we train this G? So this G is this gray box. This gray box. So uh, what it means is that so uh, in the in the in the above array, so all these white boxes are the words that are shared previously. And uh, what if the word is not shared previously? So we give it a dummy box, this gray box. So this box uh, contains all the all the cases that uh, we uh, we have. To, we should predict the word that did not appear previously. So the white boxes are the words appeared previously, and the gray box means all the cases that uh, have not appeared previously. So if uh, if you you have the probability in this case, you should pick the word from the vocabulary, right? Because this word, uh, the next word, is not a pure keyword. So, is it clear? Okay. So, you 
So uh, this G actually it's uh, it's in, inside the same thing. So uh, here we give it an initial value. So the green the green part is something that you initialize. Yeah, yeah. You give it a initial. Uh, you, you need to initialize it. And all the others you give it the hidden state you calculate previously. So what what's in the green box? What what is a vector? Uh, uh, it's just uh, it's a value. So same to the previous. Uh, it's a, a vector same to the hidden values. Uh, previous hidden value. So it's a copy of all the hidden state. Uh, no, no, it's something that you initialize it, and the uh, hidden. Uh, so, so you just compare these two. This one is a hidden value that you pass from this to this, right? Mm -hmm. And si and, oh, okay. and and this one actually it have the same dimension as that one, but uh, it, you didn't calculate it. You just initialize it. So it's a different uh, value altogether. You already learned something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's it's not it's not generated from the hidden state. Uh, no, no. So it's something you initialize and uh, at later it's just like a BIOS and at a later time you bring it. So it's just magic. So so you catch so the basic idea is just you use this grey box to catch all the cases that all the uh, cases that uh, the world didn't appear previously. So this is and uh, you use this one and in the combined uh, probability. And, and then you will calculate the uh, you cal calculate the probability of the CTL. Okay. So this is a pointer pointer setting of the mixture model. Okay. So yeah, uh, so I put that paper on the uh, Slack. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, actually, it's at the end of my class. Okay. So 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 uh, actually, the query is something like this. Uh, uh, so it's just uh, we, we, we we just change. Um, Make mix uh, some uh, non uh, more layers to calculate this query, and then it's a uh, soft map. And actually, the previously appeared words actually uh, there may be some uh, duplicates, repeated values. So we just sum them up. And uh, this is uh, not for this. It's quite simple. And uh, uh, next uh, application is uh, summarization. So uh, for here we have very long documents. And we want to extract uh, the main point of, of this long document. And uh, for here, uh, actually, we have uh, uh, in, in the uh, why this is uh, I need, I put, I take this out as a special uh, a special one where we do not use the uh, previous uh, attention model as the sequence to sequence because uh, for the su summarization is uh, quite uh, tricky. Uh, if you use the previous sequence to sequence model, actually it's more um, suitable to the uh, to, uh, sentence level. So you just translate sentence by sentence. And each sentence, uh, as what uh, just Abine um, point out, uh, you give it a SOS, US, so the start of the sentence and end of the sentence. But for this summarization, you need to uh, take the um, summarize so the length is different. Uh, and uh, uh, it's very probable that you will have some repeated phrases or sen sentences. So for here, this is one example. So you see that McDonald's appeared three times. So this is quite a, a, a bad. Uh, so this is a deficiency of the uh, attention. Uh, so uh, uh, what we should do to change our so original attention model to make it not make the phrases repeated so, uh, so actually, uh, this is another paper, and uh, it will use two kinds of uh, uh, modifications. So the first one is that, so if the previous state, previous decoding state, um, already pay much attention to some of parts of the world, then the, uh, for my current state, I will not pay too much attention to that world. So because the previous state, previous state already uh, take too much information. And for this one, I don't, I don't take too much. And the second modification is that uh, it's uh, between the de de also between the decoders. So if the, uh, I will take the uh, previous hidden state of the uh, pre uh, the hidden state of the previous decoders. So and and uh, uh, we just get all the information from the previous decoders, and then we may get some idea about uh, what are the uh, words that are I already produced, and then. For my current state, I will avoid uh, to uh, 
predict that kind of word. So uh, there are two modifications. So the first one uh, is something like this. So so here you can see that um, the same word. So we have on the same word. On, on the same word, we have uh, three. For example, we have three states. Three uh, previously. Uh, uh, I have already predicted uh, some two two of them, and the third of it. So uh, uh, the third of it is for the same word. I will look at the pre previous attention. So if these two have paid very little attention to it, and this one I can give it very large attention. Okay. So and uh, so so for uh, this is for the first modification. The second modification is just to come. Uh, to look at the previous uh, uh, already calculated hidden state of the decoders, then I will use this information to um, uh, to get the next prediction. Okay, so um, actually this paper also has some reinforcement uh, uh, learning, and uh, it is also scope I will not introduce it. And then uh, other details of the this modification. So uh, we. Notice that in the previous attention model, we have a uh, first calculate score, then calculate the uh, distri uh, probability distribution, and thirdly, we will uh, get the weighted sum. And here, we just uh, give it an uh, intermediate. Uh, so after, because, so E is the uh, score. E is the score we have. So T, I, T is the uh, state uh, time step of the decoder. I is which word, uh, which hidden state of the decoder. And for here, um, we just um, this J, J is all the previous decoders. So the previous decoders on the same encoding uh, encoders as uh, hidden state, hidden state, and I will, I will, uh, I will penalty, give the penalty on it. Okay, so and the other paths are actually the same. Now we, we get the probability distribution, and then we get the weighted uh, uh, sum. And uh, we call it a complex. Okay, so it's just uh, add one more space inside it. So just like what I have just said. And and for this one, for the decoder, actually it's just uh, same thing as the encode, encoding. Uh, gets the score, gets the uh, probability distribution, and gets the context. So it's just attend to the decoder itself. It's not only attend to the encoder, but it also attend the decoder. So it will get the, all the information that it. Already produced. Okay, and then uh, at last, so what I want uh, is have another modification is that if you use the uh, mixture model that I, uh, the pointer sentinel mixture model that I have just introduced. So nothing magic. But uh, you can see that uh, these two papers are generated by similar groups of people, and the lecture of this uh, CS224N, uh, the uh, uh, Richard, is. Uh, uh, it, it's one of the authors in both of the papers. Uh, in this, in this one, you can see uh, this one is a sigmoid. So it's a sigmoid of the uh, linear function. So what is this? So it's just a logistic re regression. Yeah. So and uh, actually, it just gives it one case and zero case. One. So it means it it will use uh, it will use the pointer, and zero means that it will use the vocabulary. Uh, but you can see uh, there is quite a difference. So in the previous one, it just puts this probability inside this training. So it's it's very it's quite different. So why they change their idea? Why there are some difference? Actually, I don't understand. Can you guys but follow it, the the slide? I know it's going back and forth a lot, so it's maybe a little hard to follow. Oh. Uh, sorry. Using the vocabulary, so 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 in the RL model, yeah. uh, we have the embeddings. So at the la at last step we have uh, the hidden state. So we will uh, use this hidden state times a uh, matrix W. Right. Uh, so right. this matrix W, uh, uh, it is uh, uh, it's uh, the oh its uh, dimension is the uh, length of the vocabulary and the hidden state, right? And then it's times together and the dimension is the vocabulary length times one column from vector. And then you get the soft soft max, and you will choose the vector oh, okay. with highest probability. So this is like, uh, 
uh, actually, in this case, in this case, uh, I'm talking about so it's predicting the network, so okay, it's not it's translation. Just standard. Yeah, sorry, yeah. So I got lost. In my sorry, this is blank. What is the thing that you had? Oh, sorry, sorry. Uh, okay. Okay. So, so uh, I think that say that what what it's trying to do is the G function will tell you whether or not for the decoder to continue decoding based on what it's what the decoder has predicted. Or switch to what you calculated from the distribution of the entire vocabulary. What other word could I possibly use at this point? So the G will switch between these two: what is what the decoder has predicted, or what my uh, mixture over the entire vocabulary has predicted. Uh, so for this case, um, uh, uh, you just talk about the switch. Uh, but for this one, actually, it's not a switch. So for this, it's just this uh, probability. Just uh, we should care. We should think that it's more probable that it is a word from the previous word, okay. or it is. Like, isn't g and one minus g a switch? Uh, for here, I, you can see it's a calculation of the probability. It's so a, in this case, it's not. The switch. Yeah, it's, oh, it's a weight. Uh, yeah. So if you look so, at so the okay, paper, so, yeah, yeah it, it's, it's waiting both of them. It's waiting both and deciding which one, right? So okay. if the weight is one uh, from the paper, it's choosing from the RNN. And uh, if it's zero, then you're basically assigning all the weight to the pointer, right? Which is that higher level part that's choosing from what's in the green box, right? Uh, if you're using the RNN, you're just uh, using the things so in the blue box. You're mixing the mixture, okay. the distribution, the probability. You're distribution. adding them adding together them as a linear combination of the probabilities from both parts. So I guess this is different from the sigmoid in that way. Yeah, yeah. The yeah. sigmoid is more of a switch. Yeah, sigmoid is a switch. And this, uh, yeah, it's half from different. To be clear, you're going down the list of possible network, right? Mm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Sorry. Maybe actually. Yeah. So actually, this is a predicting of the network. So okay, it's okay. different ap applications. But but then like the networks then try you peek forward two or three words and that right. Mm. Try to predict the next two or three. Uh, you you predict them in series, so you do the next word, and then after you have that, that's your okay. output, then you go to the okay. next. It's just like the standard RNA model. Okay. Okay. Right. So here, here the mixture gate is really a mixture. It's sure. not a switch function, as sure. you will see in other other things that Richard presents later okay. on. Okay. So I, I, I don't know what you guys know. Richard Socha was actually on campus a couple of days ago, and he gave a lecture, and we can cover a little bit of, of what he covered um, as well. And... Um, he says hello to all of you because he, he's interested to know that we're using his materials here. Yeah. Yeah. So hope you can get together. Sorry. To... So, uh, yeah. And as you say, so the last one, yeah, it's just the more. This is a kind of a switch. And then, so this is some of the final different thoughts. And because lack of time, I won't. So. Uh, at uh, at last, I just give you the type of the papers. So the first one is the, the, the just now the ab abstractive su summarization. So it's uh, different from the extractive summarization. Extractive summarization just use the same words, same sentences. And this one is your you may use different things. And then is the temporal attention model. So so this one is what is used in this uh, abstractive summarization. So last one is a pointer sentinel mixture models. And I'll just uh, so it's uh, quite close, just 2016 and 2017. So hopefully, if you are interested, you can do it too. Okay, thanks. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So we covered two models uh, there. One was a, uh, you know, the earlier model, which is just introducing attention. And I hope you understand the connection between um, pointer networks and attention, right? Attention is just to say that you attend to previous pieces of the input, right? And the pointer network is then a way to utilize that attention in some ways, right? So when you hear about uh, zero-shot learning, that comes in a lot, right? Because many times in your input data, you don't have um, things that you actually need to worry about at test time, right? And the only way you can uh, be able to predict things that you've only seen at test time is to use idea of pointing backward into your input. And that's the idea of uh, using a pointer, right? The pointer is saying, uh, 
uh, I couldn't figure out what word to construct from my vocabulary. Maybe you want to pull out a word that was just recently discussed, right? So that, that example of Yellen, uh, I forget, um, some secretary in, in the US, um, her name is, is pulled up uh, from there, right? Uh, because it wasn't part of the training data. But because it's signaled, right, uh, you have some title or, or a senator or a doctor or something, then you know it has to be something in the discourse because it probably is not mentioning somebody else's name from the past um, data that you have. So this goes back many, many, many decades in natural language processing. Uh, the, 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 the application that people at my age will tell you about will be like co-reference resolution, which means that you have to attend to earlier things to figure out what certain pronouns mean, right? So the canonical example is like, uh, you know, Apple, blah, 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 IBM, blah, 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 the company, blah, blah, blah. So what does the company mean, right? So exactly as in your example, the company could be referring to IBM or Apple, and you need to know from context which one keeps should be alive. So there's a lot of linguists who studied this type of problem. It goes back to the theory of centering, which means when you topicalize a sentence, whatever is in the subject position is much more likely to be a referent. Right, so if you say, you know, James brought the beer to Jane, uh, then you have two different people, and because James is the one doing the action, it's more likely he's going to be the referent, right? So that wasn't a good example because both of the people have different genders, but if you, you can imagine Jane gave it to Bob and you said, he then, whatever, then you can have those types of problems, okay? And uh, later, when we can talk about the, um, the DECA NLP test that Richard and his company and other people put together, we can talk about Winograd schemas, which are really, really fun things. Um, uh, we'll talk about that later. I don't want to sidetrack the lecture. Sorry about that. Just, just one last question. Before. I presume for the training for this sort of pointers, I model doesn't require you to uh, manipulate the, the training data uh, any, in any way, right? We will, we will learn from the, the source of the target sequences that if there's a repeated word. Uh, because this doesn't, isn't really just repeating as well. It's trying to also learn the, the, the distribution for, for the words that I should pick when I choose not to use the decoded word. So where, where does it get this signal from? Do I have to, do I have to add anything? The short answer is no, you don't. Uh, you can say when you train the system that it's also keeping track of words that uh, when it decodes that is actually present in that piece of training data, right? So when you read a news article and you see IBM, blah, blah, the company, and then you have a fairly good idea that uh, likelihood that IBM is the right reference to that, then you would just take note that here the sentinels should be actually pointing back to the occurrence of IBM. So then you have an idea that, you know, if I see a similar sentence like that, I see blah, 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 some, some actual company's name, and then blah, 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 the string, the company, okay, then you can say, oh, based on my prior experience, the company should be code to, to that thing that's pointed at uh, in my past history. I think that this model already exists because uh, uh, it, it will calculate the largest probability. So this is the overall probability you sometimes have. So well, if uh, if this yellow happened in the vocabulary with, with very low probability, and it, it, it happened in the previous work, and then in this time you, you see the training, training set is giving you the yellow, uh, and it happened very low probability in the vocabulary, then you will know in this time you should give a higher probability in the probability. Yeah, so it can come from both sources. I mean, uh, what was just pointed out is that's really helpful in the case where even in the training data you have the word, but it uh, gives a very low probability value, right? So you need some other corrective mechanism to say, hey, you know, 
even though it's low probability, it's the correct answer, and I need to train for that. All right, but attention also has this nice property uh, in a pointer network of being able to show zero shot learning. Right? You haven't seen this token at all, uh, this named entity at all, but yet you're able to predict and co-refer co um, that particular entity. Yeah, it's just, just like what was said here, right? Yeah. You, you would look at the output probability of that token and it doesn't match up. Yeah. Okay. All right, so uh, all right. So we talked about, uh, we did a recap of the attention and we talked about application. And yeah, next lecture, they will talk about uh, the transformer. There's, there's such a such a paper called attention is all you need and attention all the hype last year. But we won't, we won't cover now. We will talk about the skill skill up. So what, what kind of problem does it have? I mean when you're trying to scale up the machine translation. It's in the next page. So uh, the copy mechanism will not be sufficient because of the uh, transliteration or multi-word alignment we talked about uh, in the last lecture as well. And also because of the rich morphology and uh, informal scoring. So intuitively you think it's very likely you should operate in the sub-word levels because there's no way to you have this kind of uh, issue on the word level. So it's, it's very, it's very natural to go to the sub-word level. So, um, so for this part of session, Richard, or I think it's Richard, I talked about a lot of uh, papers that I was just trying to go through them quite very quickly. So, it, how to deal with the lack of vocabulary? Um, so, what what they do when we're trying to predict in the, the word? Uh, so, for this particular, you have a uh, uh, you have a vector, and you take the softmax, and you try to predict what's what's going to be the next word. Uh, what is the size of this uh, particular matrix? This is like a quick question. Which one, the blue one? Yeah, the the what, what the size of the V. Yeah, that's right. It's just it's just the vocabulary size. So, for it because because the the main the main reason they need to deal with this large output is uh, softmax is a very expensive calculation. So. Uh, if you deal with a very large vocabulary, it takes a lot of uh, computational resource. That's why uh, it's not a very efficient way to deal with, uh, with this kind of problem. So uh, another intuitive way to think of it is that can we use a small vocabulary? Uh, can we do that? What, what kind of problem can we generate? Uh, it will just give you a lot of unknown words because once you reduce the word and Reduce the vocabulary, there will be a lot of words not in your dictionary, and then you cannot predict uh, what kind of word it is. So, so that's why uh, it won't work. You have to deal the problem in the sub word level. So, okay, so for the first thought is how can we scale up, scale up the softmax? So, people do a lot of uh, research on that because uh, they want to still have the very large vocabulary size and they're trying to optimize this uh, softmax problem. So the first paper is actually using the CS trick to deal with uh, using a tree structure to deal with to reduce the computation. And the second one is uh, using the noisy constructive estimation. So the same thing we use in what you as well. So I, I just put a definition over there. So, but the problem is uh, it, it is trying to optimize this softmax problem, but it's not GPU friendly. Because, uh, for example, the tree structure is, just, you have to go through the tree. You, you couldn't do things in parallel. So that's why it's not, it's not ideal, because we want to do things in a faster manner. So uh, the Benjios group uh, come up with this uh, solution to uh, call it a large vocab, you know, uh, MT. So it's, the main idea is it's GPU friendly, so it's more practical. You can train a lot of data. Uh, so the, the, 
the problem is, yeah, the, the problem is there. It's a, it's a training complexity as, of, as well as the decoding complexity increase proportional to the to the vocabulary size, and they are trying to do do it in in a such a manner. Uh, I, I will talk about that later. So it will it will be both fast, both in the training and the test time. So during the training, uh, you just use a small batch of the vocabulary. So, so because of when you look at the document, uh, a lot of the words is like a rare word. It's not it's not it's not happening a lot. Maybe you just have one or two, but it it just makes the whole vocabulary size very large. So when you are selecting a uh, like partition uh, a small a small paragraph, most likely you won't see this kind of a rare word. So. So what you're doing is you're just trying to select a very a, a smaller uh, vocabulary. Then you do a softmax on uh, on each batch. So it's, in this manner, you make the training process faster. So the way to do it, this is like uh, the way to do it is to partition the training data into the subsites, and every time you just do a softmax on the subsite. This. In this way, you can you can you can speed it up, and also because of the GPU can process data parallelly, so you just partition the data, and then you can process the data at the same time. So that's why it's uh, it's, it's probably GPU friendly because they propose a way to partition the data. And this is the mechanism. So you select the distinct. So the keywords distinct. The set distinct. For example, if you set five distinct uh, word, and then every every subset is this. I just look at the video and they said there are many smart way to to do this uh, process. And for example, you can group the similar words together. But yeah, so that's how you can optimize the whole process. And in practice, you can reduce the the magnitude by tenfold. So for example, your original your original vocabulary is five hundred K, you can reduce it to to fifty K. How do you reduce it if let's say the rare word I presume you are you are you are reducing it based on the training samples, right? Mm -hmm. So you are going to pick training samples to them together where they share a lower vocabulary size. Mm -hmm. Let's like say about mm -hmm. uh, oh, ten thousand, I split them to five thousand, five thousand. Mm -hmm. Five thousand will have a smaller vocabulary size and mm -hmm. smaller subject to fit that, right? Mm -hmm. but what if what if for that partition we have rare words also occurring with You will meet the you will meet the real word. You, you will meet the uncommon word, but it's just a mechanism for you to partition the data and train multi batch in the same time to speed up the whole training process. But I'm also using a smaller softmax because I'm not just I'm not just splitting the training samples and to do parallel. I'm also reducing the softmax. Not sure about this part. You know, I mean, because now you're talking about the D is the D that's your the softmax number of uh, classes that are being predicted. So how are we going to reduce it to 150 k? Unless we are talking about very short sentences, because if it's a document, a mm -hmm. uh, whole document, the rare words will have if they appear, they will fit together with a lot of common words. I don't know. I don't know about this one. Maybe the professor can't help me. Oh, sorry, I wasn't paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Just like all of you when you go to lecture, huh? What's going on? <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I was dealing with polytechnic <laughs> stuff. Go ahead. Uh, can Can you guys repeat, repeat your question? Yeah. Yeah. So, so because you partition, I'm just trying to figure out how are you partitioning the training set of your data, right? Such that you can bring your soft max down to 30k or 50k from uh, 500k. Because typically when you talk about distribution of words in text, um, the top 
most documents will have the common word. Okay. Right? But the, some documents will have the, the rare so, word. So I, I, think, I think if I would describe it as a way from this number, I would say that, you know, imagine the, the numbers are You sample a small number of them and you learn enough of them. You learn enough of the connection that even if you haven't seen the rest, you can always hypothesize the remaining. I would say information is a very good problem. I actually have like another. Uh, so, so, one idea I'm having is that actually the Yeah. If you run this on a GPU, you might change What about um, kind of uh, having evolving the idea of RNN right? So a lot of architectures have gone away from RNN because of exactly this serial dependency. But, but what so about we're going to see. You could. I mean, that's also somewhat expensive to calculate, right? I mean, anything that requires sequential computation, like a simulated alleling, would would be a bit uh, expensive to run. Oh. So the idea behind a lot of the newer work, uh, for example, revisiting CNNs and other transformer network, are to take it practical advantage of the fact that you have awesome capabilities on the GPU to do immense number of very simple parallel right. computations, right? right. So we can try to get away with that. Um, uh, let, let's uh, before we go there, let's talk a little bit more about the vocabulary, right? Which is what we're talking about here. So here we're trying to say that we're going to shrink the amount of vocabulary that we're using um, to do the decoding, right? So how how can we do that, right? But I think uh, I I just scanned through the slides. I have never seen this material before, so I'm guessing at this point. Okay, but I can give you a more definitive answer in 10 minutes after I read the papers. Okay, but basically the idea is, you know, you want to have uh, some of the common vocabulary. And you probably know NLP is very uh, long tail, right? We have a very small amount of terms that are what we call open, uh, closed class words. These are like determiners, uh, function words, prepositions, conjunctions. But we have an amazing number of open class words, nouns and verbs, adjectives and adverbs. Uh, there's no end to them. People coin new ones every day, right? So the problem here is uh, you want to keep most of the closed class words in your vocabulary. So even in your V prime, you're only selecting 50,000 or 30,000 words, okay? You want to keep most of those function words. It, it would be sort of silly not to have the word the, a, or and in the vocabulary because, well, then you, you'd have problems, right? That would become an unknown word. But for a lot of um, rare words, Right, uh, open class words like nouns uh, and verbs that don't happen very often, you can think that these are semantically clustered. Right, so for example, if I have the word dog, it's quite likely that I have puppy, cat, veterinarian also somewhere close by, but probably we won't have something like uh, I don't know a uh, wall clock um, in the same sentence as dog. Right, so uh, you can look at you know, some type of correlation matrix, co-occurrence matrix, to try to decompose this. You use anything you'd like for that, like SVDs, PCA, whatever you want, okay, to try to pull together clusters of vocabulary, either using that or supervised topic models, to say, okay, here's a group of vocabulary that usually sits together in sentences and documents, so I'm going to put them in one page, right? Those of you who took computer architecture, I don't know how many decades ago, you uh, still have that same concept, right? That a page of memory has to be stuff that the computer needs to access concurrently, right? Because if you have a page fault, well, then it takes forever. You have to go to disk and or the network to get it, and it comes back, right? This is the exact same idea, right? You want to put the words that you're most likely to need a computation and estimate for in the same memory block, right? In the same B prime, right? So you're just taking your your 500k vocabulary and striping it over different parts. Right. Does that help? Okay. 
So again, you can think of, uh, I would say, closed class words, things that don't change in a function uh, a language, okay, that are basically giving you the functional roles of uh, words in a sentence, like what word is related to what word and why, right? This is what all the function words in English and other languages do to glue them together. And note that in many languages, like uh, Richard said in the earlier slides, functional information may not be attached as separate words are, as in English, right? They can be tied to morphemes, right? The case in adjectives and adverbs in English show that, right? We have est, E-S-T, for a superlative adjective, L-Y, for changing an adjective into an adverb, okay? All of those are morphological suffixes that have, have the same type of purpose as closed class, class words, right? In Japanese, it's more pronounced, right? You have uh, particles uh, written in hiragana that uh, define what role a, a particular noun uh, has within a sentence, right? So in, in English, it, it materializes in many ways, right? You have things like in, of, at, which are prepositions. Then you have suffixes like s for plural and other things like that, um, which we've already talked about that manifest uh, other, the same type of information, but for other things, okay? So uh, in many ways, when we think about how to segment the data, you also have to take that into account. Does that help? Three hundred dimensions. Yeah. Well, that's exactly the point. We don't want to do a random sample because we take a random sample of all of the embedding. Is it saying I take a random sample of any word? All right. Basically, I go through the entire dictionary and I flip random pages until I pick out enough words to assemble my V prime. Correct. So if you do clustering within the embedding space and say for each of, let's say, let's say you do K, K means clustering, right? You say, I want 10 clusters because I want 500K into 50, for example, right? Then you couldn't do that, right? But the important part here is, again, there's a difference between open class words and closed class words, right? Open class words like the, and, is, we wouldn't say they are particularly representative of any semantics, right? They are things that glue other things together, right? And they tell us what functional role things have in language, right? It's very different from open class words. Open class words are content words. They describe the semantics, the meaning of the sentence, and they are definitely clusterable, right? You see doctor, it's very likely you see nurse, you see medicine, you see hospital, you see medical bills, right? All of those things are very likely when you see the word doctor, right? But you can't say what you would see if you saw the word the, right? Or is, right? It's just generally collocated with everything because they tell us the relationship between things. Sir? <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, I so, uh, so are we... I think that's what we're, we're talking about here, is we want to be able to train these networks in sure. parallel, right? I think that's what was talked about, right? And, and to be able to stripe it. So instead of oh. training one oh. big thing with 500K, okay. Oh, okay. we want to train 10 things with 50K oh, okay. and get the same output, okay? Or a similar output to it. Uh, in parallel? In parallel. Oh, I see. So, so what I'm, I'm trying to understand, uh, because each paper normally they're trying to solve each one problem, so the thing they are trying to do is to try to skew up the softmaps. And to trust, so to skew up the softmaps, you probably need to do things parallelly. So that's why I think the 
it's intuitively you, you just use a subset of the data you just chunk them the sub size and try to present the color. Um, this is like one of the way they make things happen. I didn't go into detail because my section had too many papers. I'm trying to understand each paper in a <laughs> more intuitive way. <laughs> I didn't. I, I, I tried a little bit, but I think that the way they make it work is very challenging. So I didn't go into as much details. So uh, I will just continue and yeah. Uh, so in the test time, so what they're trying to do is you have to speed up with both things. You couldn't just speed up the training time, but test time becomes a bottleneck. So in the test time, they they came up with this kind of a mechanism called a pendulum loose. So they, they, they first, they separate some word out. Uh, they call it a most important word, a uni, unigram crop. So it will be added to the softmax. It's like a common function word we always have to uh, have in the softmax. And then they have some candidate target word. For example, sheet of cats has some, every English word have a three French candidates. And then they, they just uh, sum up, uh, add them together to create a candidate list, and the softmax will only process on this candidate list. In this manner, uh, you reduce, uh, you again, you reduce the computational complexity. Um, so, reduce a lot of computation power. But the issue is uh, the candidate list is, uh, depends on the source sentence, so it must be recomputed for each sentence. I actually, uh, and also, it's, it's, they, they have a very good result because they do the reshuffling. But the problem is uh, reshuffling actually takes, uh, uh, it's very expensive. Uh, this is the comments. I, I just read other people's comments for this paper. Uh, if you have any idea like how to more easily uh, explain this uh, issue, uh, just, uh, just raise up. But, uh, yeah. Sorry? You're training several RNNs in parallel. So my, my, guess, my guess why they need to reshuffle it is the mechanism they propose is to subsequently select a data, select a, each batch. But then if you reshuffle, maybe you can boost because it seems like they don't. We don't have a lot of really nice training, things. But we are training several RNNs in parallel, right? Several RNNs in parallel. I'm doing So I think, is this the blackout paper that you're looking at now? And then it's the Benjo's paper about a large vocab. And okay, you. I'm reading the wrong one. I'm ahead of you. Just the, the softmax portion. So they they try to optimize two phase training phase and test phase. Training phase, the way they optimize is to use a subset of the vocabulary at a time and oh, okay. test set. They try to produce a candidate list instead of a go through the whole vocabulary. Okay, so there are two more paper. Uh, Blackout and uh, uh, more as a constructive estimation, but uh, and they're trying to solve the same problem with uh, different techniques. Um, I just put comments here, uh, but the problem for for skewing softmax is also insufficient because when you skew up the softmax, it still depends on your vocabulary. You still couldn't deal with the new names and the new numbers, and theoretically, when you are during the test time, you want to have an infinite vocabulary because you have always new names. Always new text you have to do it. So uh, they do subword MT, and there are two trends. The yeah, first trend is the same sequence to sequence architecture, just with the smaller units. Uh, and also the second one is uh, is is I think it's from Manning and uh, his his student. So yeah, they, they will they will they will, they will mm -hmm. I will talk about this uh, later. So the first thing is that you can do the byte pair encoding. So actually, byte pair encoding, this concept is hard from computer science. Uh, yeah, it's a, it's a data compression technique. So you can replace the most frequent pair of bytes in sequence with a single and use byte. So what they are doing is they use this concept in the uh, character level. 
So the most frequent paired character, they just group them together as a pair of bytes. So uh, the algorithm happens like this. You first, you just have all the vocabularies, and then you find the most frequent pairs, and then you just add it as your new vocabulary. So, so yeah, so you start with characters, and now you, in, in the end, you generate a hundred pair. Um, so the problem, uh, so the main contribution for this one is, yeah, you can, you can deal with the open vocabulary uh, because you generate a new vocabulary on the fly. But the uh, problem is also, they, they talk about it in the conclusion part, is uh, the, the choice of vocabulary size is somewhat arbitrary. Uh, it's just motivated by comparison to a third work. So it, the size is just a magic number. If you find it just happens to work, and then just use it. So, but they, you can check out the, the GitHub, they, they win the top place in the WMT 2016, means they have a very good performance, so it means their tricks really works well. So I'll comment about this. Byte pair encoding comes from information retrieval, so uh, think about search engines many years ago, even pre-Google pre people were doing this on um, on basic indexing structures when you, you typed into a terminal and tried to retrieve documents. So there, again, um, in many languages, you have sequences of characters that are very common. And uh, the entropy of those uh, character sequences is very low. That's why you can zip up files and you can save space, right? Because the idea that a string of, of, of characters has some, um, has some non-trivial repetition which you can encode away. So uh, byte pair encoding is, is used to represent documents, and um, it's actually been used quite a lot for in NLP for morphological segmentation, exactly the type of problems that we talked about earlier, where there's uh, morphology within a word, right? So you, you've seen a couple examples on the slides that Richard has where uh, especially Scandinavian languages have ridiculously long words, right, which are uh, basically a basic sentence in one, one frame. Okay, so um, there is a little bit of morphological um, variation. So some I's might become Y's or the re re reverse. But basically, you're trying to conserve that information and encode that as a subword. Just like in English, the word is is a connector between two words, right? But in some languages, you don't have is. You just put these two words together, put a morphological thing in the middle, and that that that's preserving things, right? So. Um, by pair encoding is one way to do that, where you say, uh, I'm just going to look for common subsequences and then encode those as first, uh, first class entities, right? So we promote them as words, right? In English, we do this all the time too. So uh, for example, we have some words that we just glue together um, and make new words out of them, like mailbox, right? Mailbox is one word, but originally when it started out, it was two separate words, but because it became so common, we glued them together, and we just think of mailbox, right? Email used to be hyphenated, now many people don't hyphenate it anymore, okay? So the idea of going back to individual parts of characters or words, even if you're Chinese, you can think about radicals or things like that, and say those are somehow components of words that have either a semantic or functional meaning. You preserve them by encoding them, Okay, and then uh, using that strategy to uh, help you uh, save space in terms of byte pair encoding, or in some cases, preserve semantics, right? So you take all of the, the Chinese characters with jin as a radical, right, metal, and you say, okay, they're all related, and you want to put them in the same cluster and uh, encode them or decode them together, okay? So actually, uh, you'll see that a lot of uh, NMT work uh, has really gotten a big boost from uh, this type of subword encoding. Uh, and even in my research area, we use it a lot. Uh, so, for example, one of the research uh, projects I supervised was on um, uh, sorry, classifying web pages without the web page. How do you do that? You look at the URL, right? If you look at the URL, you know where it points to and you have an idea of what the target page is. Okay, but in a domain name, sometimes you don't hyphenate or you don't underline words, right? You just glob them all together for it so you get one big chunk of English, right? So 
you can imagine what it's like to an information retrieval engine. If you just tokenize by word, it's just one big word. How do you know what, what it means, right? But if you have subword information, then you can, right? You can just basically run the same type of algorithms as what we were doing here, byte pair encoding or other things of that sort, and say there is meaning in that token. Go fetch it out and do something with it, okay? All of us who are familiar with CJK languages have this work every day. I mean, Chinese doesn't come with spaces, but we have no problem reading it, right? Thai doesn't come with spaces, but we have no problem reading it because we are doing this internal segmentation. English didn't used to have spaces when paper was very precious, right? Now, of course, it's not a problem, right? Okay. So all of these technologies that we have seen in previous generations of NLP, generations of information retrieval are coming back and having a neural version of it. Okay, so that's, that's very nice to see. Same type of technologies are having an, an, another effect. It's just that the schematics of how you do these technologies are a little different because there's certain architectures that are more valuable than others, right? So now we have something called a GPU. It can do thousands of thousands of computations on one, one, one clock cycle or, or equivalent of that. So we want to make things ludicrously fast for many data elements, but very simple. Okay. So this is a, a very early work, so it's yeah. gotten much more mature than this now. But uh, this is just to introduce the concept. And instead of looking at single words, now we want to observe within a word. You say within a word still has meaning, especially for NMT on Scandinavian languages or other like German German nouns, especially have a lot of this, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, they just propose different uh, methods to solve the problem on the subword NMT problem. So this is another work from uh, CMD. Uh, and they do character-based uh, LSTM. So basically, just use the bidirectional LSTM due to the word representations. Um, so they benefit. So this model benefits traditional baseline, uh, particularly in those kind of uh, uh, morphologically rich language like Turkish, like maybe the Scandinavia language. Um, so um, the model, uh, just they just uh, briefly talk about this model uh, because uh, I think this is all like the uh, intuitively you should do things on uh, you can do things on practical level and using the LSTM to to build this uh, word representation. And uh, this is I guess this is all they talk about all these different. Uh, paper, their work is to, to promote their own work because uh, it's most likely the, uh, by the time it was the state of art, uh, is, uh, they, they build a hybrid mode. So they do word level first and then they try to um, do character level when the word is unknown. So they have all the code and the data and the models published in the Stanford website. Uh, the, uh, the advantage for this model is uh, it's a hybrid model, so uh, it's faster. You do, you do things on word level first, and then you do it at the level, so it's faster. And uh, it also doesn't have the unknown word in the end, because uh, all the unknown words on the, on the second step, they process and generate the, the character level generator. So it's actually two paths. The first path is uh, you operate on word level and have the uh, and known the token as it is. Uh, so the word level is just a normal uh, LCM. Uh, so uh, they're just stacking LCM together and do the end-to-end training. Uh, so for example, the acute cat can, they can, they can predict everything except the cute. Uh, so, so on the second level, when they are trying, so there's a two stage. First stage is the word level in, in search. Uh, the, on the second stage, they do the beam search, but on the correct level, so they're trying to um, translate this uh, unknown word with attention. So I, I read the paper, it seems like uh, every stage, the word level and the correct level, they are using different weights because they don't want to put too much pressure on one weight, so they're using a different W. Uh, 
so the, the second W can only take care of the, uh, can take care of the data level generation by itself. Um, so the, the many challenging part. The main challenge I think is how to initialize the hidden states. Um, the way they do it is uh, they except for the I think except for one for the what hidden state except for, for they, they do it using the they just initialize it to zero because in this way they, they can parallelize. They can process faster. Uh, yeah, the details, I, I won't go through the details, you can check the paper. Uh, it's pretty clear, but uh, yeah, it's hard to, some, some, some of the other tricks, it's hard to understand. So they just, by their new trick, they, they managed to get a better blue score. So yeah, they also, they also in, the, in, the, in the paper, they also talk about uh, the CMU group, I think they are just competitors, so that's why they, <laughs> They are talking about whatever they are doing previously is not uh, significant, and you are going to have a very good result. So just a, a point uh, of interest, uh, Luang, that name there, is our, our previous student in SOC. So he actually did free space MMT and subword MMT while he was here in NUS before he went to Christmas school. So he had some experience uh, from us before going there. But I just checked the blue score. I think now it's no longer the state of art. They have a better models, better architecture to solve the problem, and have a better result. So this is like this uh, you know, uh, this uh, something's wrong. It's broken. It's broken. Yeah. So that's all. What's the better example? I I didn't put on my slab, but uh, I I think problem is uh, for example if you check. This year's stack and the last year's lecture, a lot of materials are no longer covered. And if you look at the papers, every single one of the papers saying they are getting the state of art result, meaning this field is really moving really fast. So I didn't put it there, but probably can check. Yeah, I think so many things have happened within the last two years, and it's still happening. People are still trying very stupid things, and they're working. <laughs> um, so uh, that's good for all of you. It's easier to publish as long as you have a good model and lots of GPU firepower. I mean, if you, if you went to Richard's talk, they said they spent, I don't know, several thousand GPU hours and with a cluster of like 100 GPUs. I mean, I can afford one GPU for my cluster. <laughs> so uh, we, we can't do the same type of research as Salesforce or Google, but uh, we can still do really good stuff. So. Um, yeah, so it's a really interesting time to be in NLP, uh, where stupid gets you good mileage. Uh, it, it harkens back to other work uh, that uh, we, we've seen in, in linguistics before. So uh, just to give you a little bit of history, uh, there's this very famous uh, linguist. Uh, he is a speech researcher. You will need to know his name if you do an ANLP. His name is Fred Jelinek. He was previously an uh, IBM Watson researcher, and he worked at C uh, JHU and CMU. Uh, so that's Johns Hopkins and Carnegie Mellon. And he was attributed to a quote that he doesn't remember saying, which is, every time I fire a linguist, my accuracy goes up. Okay? <laughs> which means even at the time in the 90s, when people were first thinking about corpora as a way of deriving useful models for translation, back then people thought, oh no, you need human translations, you need grammatical rules to do translation, right? Um, he said, no, I don't think so, because we we're getting pretty good results with uh, what we saw earlier, phrase-based uh, translation models, right? He says, I don't understand it. The more people I get rid of, the more computation I replace it with, the better the performance gets, right? It's like uh, the theory doesn't follow the practice, right? The more you just do the practice, the better you get at it. You don't need to understand what you're doing. And somehow that sort of makes sense, right? I mean, we talked about this before. When you construct a sentence, when you understand somebody else's dialogue, are you creating parse trees in your head? No, right? Obviously not. But somehow you're able to still understand, somehow you're able to generate sentences without much thought to it, without an appear, uh, appealing to a logical form farther up the uh, uh, machine translation swimming pool, which I showed you last time. Right? So something is happening. It's almost like a reflex, a, a second nature after a while, that we can generate sentences and we can understand sentences 
without really needing to cognitate too much about it, right? So it, it's this rule is, uh, that Jelinek was attributed to is actually quite unfortunately true. You know, we've gotten a lot farther with machine translation than ever before, and it hasn't been because linguistics uh, department has really upped its ante, right? It's because uh, GPU has made uh, a lot of uh, easy computations much more palatable, and the fact that we have a lot of large data at our disposal, right? So uh, you'll see this again and again for at least the next couple of years. I mean, attention papers weren't around four years ago. Now uh, you guys are learning about it only four years out, and pretty much all the slides that are on the web that Richard has released are completely out of date now. And he told me, yeah, we have an internal set at Stanford and uh, ones that are in Salesforce, but uh, unfortunately they're not public. So we get to learn, uh, well, not too bad, two years ago, right? And, and I, that's why I'm asking you guys as questioners, go fetch out the current papers because the current state of the art is like at least 10 blue points ahead of what, what you guys are studying now. But the tricks are not that much different, okay? They're just refined versions of the things that you have here. In some cases, it's just a ton of tuning, okay? Which I really, really, really despise, right? Because this uh, tuning is not science. Tuning is engineering, and it's not the province of academics to do. It's pro the province of people with their own power utilities, like you Google or other companies who can afford that. It does matter a lot. Yeah, because I found that like, I, I set up two different one networks and I can show directly both of them should be very different. Yeah, there's a lot of tricks to it. So uh, people uh, at various times when they were learning deep learning told, told me it's a black art. You know, there's a lot of optimization, <laughs> a lot of settings, yeah. And a lot of like, why isn't it working type of problems where you cannot, I mean, because it's opaque, right? You can't really see what's going on in networks. It's too high dimensional to figure out. So you have to sort of uh, rumble around in the dark. And uh, the more you talk about it to other people, the more that you can also receive it, uh, advice from others. And that helps a lot. Yeah. But I will say a lot of the models that we have that are working really well are very primitive. It's, it's sort of embarrassing. Uh, that they work as well as they do. Okay, so there's a lot of room for improvement. And a lot of it is just revisiting the old literature. Like you saw the bipair encoding, that's been around since at least the 70s. Okay, it's just that, okay, now there's a place to apply it again. So I go read the old literature, oh, I can put it in. And then uh, it's a rank one paper. Wow, look at that. I get to travel to Europe. Okay, not so bad. Okay, go ahead, Adam. Oh, yeah, let's thank our last presenter. So I'm Adam, I'm going to be talking about uh, quasi or quasi RNN. Okay, so we've seen a lot about RNNs so far. Uh, we saw some of their limitations as well, such as the vanishing gradient problem, and we saw and the exploding gradient problem as well. And we saw how these can be alleviated somewhat with the, the LSTM and the GRU as well. But I think related to what Mohit was talking about earlier, the main problem with RNNs is because of this sequential input of data and having to be processed, um, it can be very slow and you can't really parallelize it. And in contrast with that, we look at CNN, the convolutional neural network. It's much faster in this aspect, but it doesn't really capture the sequential dependency of data, uh, which is obviously what we're looking at in NLP tasks. So we want to know how we can handle sequential dependencies between the input data without having to do a lot of heavy computation in creating the sequential dependencies between the hidden states in the network. And so you can probably guess that the solution to this would be the quasi-RNN. Uh, so just in case anyone needs a, a reminder of how our convolutional neural network works, uh, I haven't actually studied it myself, but I'm, I think the main features are the convolution stage, where you apply a filter to a data and just a matrix multiplication, basically. Uh, and then the pooling, where so you, you kind of have another filter 
And so in this case, it's just taking the highest value out of that uh, filter that it has and putting it into um, the filtered yeah, the filtered data, so it kind of reduces the dimensionality. Uh, that can really help speed the process up. So this is the basic architecture that we're looking at with the q um, The solid blocks show where things can be parallelized, and the red blocks symbolize where um, the convolutions happen, so just matrix multiplication, basically. Uh, and you can see it's quite similar to the CNN. Uh, we, we basically just alternate between convolutions and pooling and follow these equations here. And the main thing to take away from here is that, actually, I think the next slide will explain it better. Yeah, so this is the pooling uh, aspect of it. So the top one is only the forget gate. So we have the output vector forget gate and the output gate. The uh, first one only uses the forget gate to find the new state. Uh, the second one, these are just different variables that you can use. And the second one will use the output as well, and the third one uses the input and the uh, forget gate and output gate as well. Um, so the key point here is essentially that these three vectors that are being output from the convolutional layer, they aren't relying on previous time steps in order to calculate them. So you can parallelize finding all these different vectors from the data um, in one go. And all the, the sequential processing is happening in this layer here. You calculate the hidden state here. For all the, Essentially, we're doing um, so. Okay. So, because you reduce the dimensions with a convolution, and then you apply a sequential, um, a sequential dependent yeah. operation, yeah. In the somewhat reducing the total cost. Yeah. Like yeah. Some yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So the only aspect uh, sequentially. Having this pooling section here, and you basically need to compute things using the different uh, time steps. But here, you can see there's no like reliance on z t minus one here. So you can calculate them all at the same time. Yeah, and that's the difference with the regular RNN. And the same for f and o. As well. Um. So how would you go about regularizing this? This new architecture is, I think, it's pretty much just an extension of the work done on LSTMs. So, I think it was put dropout then or zone out. I'm not sure what the difference between dropout and zone out is. Dropout is when you uh, just cancel parts of the network. So, you, you take a, a particular neuron and you cancel it out for that uh, mini batch training. Right? You, you just deactivate it so it can get more generalization over more time steps. Uh, I'm not sure uh, what the other term you use. What's the other yeah, one? Yeah, well, I'll bring up in the paper at the end. It's called zone out. But yeah, I couldn't really tell the difference. Okay, uh, we'll try to uh, go figure it out. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, this. Well, yeah, I guess it doesn't have to. Yeah, so perhaps this picture wasn't the best to show. Why, why wouldn't you have, like, why do you have to use the Why is it two different, like, like, two different worldviews? I mean, like, I'm sure that you can find something like that. What was the question? Um, so what, what, what if you want to translate from so actually the CNN is still applicable in uh, sequence. Uh, it's just that you, you think of a one-dimensional sequence rather than a two-dimensional. 
seen and it works very well visually on, on, on images, right? Because you can have this three by three grid with the center, right? But, but What's a, what, what, what is a need for a 2D LSTM? A 2D LSTM you can use for spatially. Uh, uh, you can use a 2D LSTM for any 2D information, like even on an image, you could use a 2D LSTM. Right? It's just that in the image, then you would have sequential information being passed from, let's say, the top to the bottom or from the left to the right. Right. Any anywhere where you have sequential information um, in a dimension, then you could use an LSTM on RSM. Right. Like, okay. Maybe you could use yeah. it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yes. Because uh, NLP is mostly concerned about sequences of either text or audio. Yeah. If you do 2D, you actually go into the definition of the set itself. Yeah. 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 Which doesn't really make sense. What if you have some That's still two different sequences. Oh, yeah. Okay. We wouldn't okay. think of it as vertical. Okay. You could have multiple uh, LSTMs running the same dimension that are all synchronized if you wanted to do that. That's very common. Yeah. So everyone understand why CNN still apply for natural language processing? Even though the normal picture of CNNs is a two-dimensional picture, that's not what we actually mean by a CNN. A CNN is just a convolution operation, right? It's just saying that I'm at state T, Okay, and I care about things at t minus 1, t minus 2, t plus 1, t plus 2, right? It's just that in this picture, we have, like, say, uh, four neighbors front-wise and four neighbors afterwards or something like that, right? So in a CNN, we're basically saying that timestamp uh, of the signal is important, and I'm looking uh, both forward and back a fixed amount uh, to understand what I should do at this Yeah, then you can have uh, both both uh, parts of the spectrum represented. Yeah. Okay. So yeah. Um, essentially, recognition for for QRNN. Uh, what the authors suggested, just keeping the falling state for a stochastic subset of the channels. So essentially, you'll just keep a number of the FK which is one. Um, Alternatively, you also found it useful to use what are called skip connections. So basically, you can pretty much see it in this picture. Instead of simply going through the different layers like this, you have connections between each of the layers. So in total, if you have L layers, then L times L minus one connections in total. And this, I imagine this helps with the uh, vanishing gradient problem and improves the gradient flow. But obviously, with all these new connections, you've got parameters and weights assigned to all of them. So the parameter can be drastic in the number of layers that you have. So a lot of these were developed uh, in tandem with Rayu. So uh, when we still use sigmoid and tan each as activation functions, we still have this big problem that you guys already learned about of vanishing and exploding gradients. Right? So definitely the problem there was that when you wanted to do back propagation and train, you'd lose your signal as you go farther and farther back. So in order to get these very large networks, they decided, okay, what I'm going to do is just preserve the gradient. Whatever gradient I get at the top, I, uh, I'm going to keep a copy of that and pass it all the way to the bottom, hence all those arcs on the network. So uh, they're getting copies of the original gradient from that first block so that they can train, right? Even though they're also getting inputs from the, the previous block. So let's say that, that um, I don't know, yellow colored block is getting information from all of the, the red, the red, the green, and the purple block, even though the, only the purple block is directly connected to it. Okay. These are always uh, tricks, if you will, again, those black ma dark magic tricks 
of trying to get the neural network to train the darn thing because it won't train very well because you lose the gradient. Right? When you lose the gradient, you're stuck on a table. You don't know which way is down. Right? So you need somewhere to tell you which way is down. So we just pick copies of what we, we had before and we pass it down. So later when Adam goes to talk about zone out, we'll see something similar to that. So I'm looking at that now. Um, yeah, so these are the results that they found when applying it to language modeling. Uh, you can see the regular LSTM in the top part and then QRNNs lower down. And you see that results are pretty comparable, um, but the parameter count is millions lower. And then also the bottom table shows uh, how much faster using a QRNN is compared to uh, LSTM. Uh, and well, the fastest it gets is 16.9 times faster. And that's when the batch size is very small, the sequence length is very large. Obviously that kind of makes sense because if you have a very long sequence length, you're having loads of different hidden states or relying on the previous one, it's going to be very slow. Um, yeah, but when you have uh, really large batch sizes, and well, even, it doesn't really matter the sequence length, then it's almost comparable. It's only 1.3 or 1.4 times faster. And uh, so the limitations for the QRNN, uh, subsequent papers that these authors uh, published talk about how, on character level, uh, neural language modeling, LSTM still works better. And um, this suggests that the pooling techniques that they're using to handle the dependencies um, isn't always that successful. And I think this paper here talks about that. And here are some links to, which can probably explain all this much better than I can. Um, so the original paper, this one, I think this is the introductory paper to all of this work. Such as in there as well. Yeah. And this, I find this interesting because apparently uh, Baidu's deep voice project is using QRNNs. Um, so basically, they take uh, text data or some speech data and they've trained their network so that when they, uh, they take some input, they can either they can change the words that this person has been saying. They can change the gender of the person that's saying it, or they can change the accent of the person saying it. So, oh, it's not something to explain. Yeah, it's a pretty good time on it. Some have accepted, 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 the first section is changing the words that the woman is saying. The second one, I think, is changing the gender. And I think the third lot is changing the accent. So that's quite interesting. Uh, and yeah, here's a paper here talking about zone out, which I haven't actually read, so I don't think I can talk about it now. Okay. Uh, but in case you're interested. Yeah. So from the abstract, the, the zone out is, is very similar to the the skip connections that you saw uh, on Adam's slide a couple of um, pages back. Okay, the idea behind zone out is that you, you just keep the uh, activation instead of destroying it. So, uh, you know, you are we've already talked about dropout, right? Dropout basically cancels out neurons and says, uh, you're not allowed to participate in this, this bit of training. And that's to help with the generalization, right? So what they do with zone out is just say, okay, you're frozen. You know, you, 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 you're still in the exist in the network, but you have to pass your, your gradient right through. And you're not allowed to change anything for this round. 
So in, in some ways, you still get the passing of the gradient through, so you, you get the rest of the network to train, but you're still part of the network. You still allow yourself to participate, but you're not allowed to adjust for anything. Okay, so it's like, I don't know, making a neuron into glass, right? You just conduct the things through, and then, uh, you know, you get unglassed in, in, a, in the next mini-batch training. All right, so you're yes. finished, right? Yeah. You're at the Let's give a hand to Adam. And so let's give another round of applause to everyone who presented for our week seven. Okay, so that's it for today. Uh, we'll break for 10 minutes before uh, whoever wants to join us is welcome to hop with me on the shuttle bus to the O-Bar. We have an appointment there at 8.30, so we have plenty of time. Okay, uh, those of you in week eight, if you are here, or week nine, maybe you guys can stick around in separate parts of the room to organize yourselves. Um, so we'll see the rest of you next time.